their law. And I did talks to thousands of people throughout the country. Before COVID, I traveled very widely speaking on health reform. I've kept up with it since and um, share with people what's going on and more from a, a practical perspective instead of the deep weeds of, of healthcare. So that's what we're gonna do today. The way I would like for you to do questions is to put them in the Q&A box and I will have stopping points where I will answer those questions. And we're gonna use the full time here and um, hopefully you guys will learn a lot and we'll have a lot of fun doing it. So the first thing I am going to cover is I will go through a review of the history of healthcare reform. A lot of people have no idea how we've gotten to where we are. And uh, this takes about 10 minutes and people find that it is the most surprising thing that they have maybe, uh, learned about healthcare reform. So I think you'll, you'll find it fascinating. Then we'll go over the cost of the healthcare system and then the current thinking of health reform, both through from the democratic um, policies, Republican policies, what Trump has done, what Biden is um, expected to do, and also share a little bit about Medicare for all. And then I'm gonna cover a little bit more about what is real reform. And so people are already asking at the beginning, do I support Medicare for all legislation? Um, what we're going to do here is you know, it's, it's funny, I write for Forbes and um, I've been writing for them for about 10 years now and I'm the moderate. So um, when the Affordable Care Act passed, I talked about all the good stuff and the bad stuff about the Affordable Care Act. And whenever I'd write something good about it, I would get um, hate mail from the right. And whenever I would write something bad about it, I would get hate mail from the left. And so what I'm going to be here is just very, um, blunt about the policies and in, in the end you'll we'll all probably figure out that whatever this country wants to make work is what we will make work. So that's where we're going to start. So now let's go through um, to me just a very fun part. Um, I'm a, my, one of my hobbies is um, um, health historian stuff and so we're going to take you through um, basically from Truman on. I, I'm not going to cover Roosevelt. Roosevelt did want to help our country's healthcare system, but I think everybody agrees that his hands were full with both the depression and then a war, and there just wasn't a big appetite to try to address healthcare reform when they had so many other things to address. Truman, it was a huge thing for. Truman wanted to do health reform, but he really couldn't get it together the first couple of years. And there was a lot of opposition to any health reform because about half the country had health insurance and coverage. And the big um, protesters against health reform were, were actually the VA system. And people go, wow, why the VA system? You know, back then, the VA's system was fantastic. It was well funded, just coming out of the war. We took care of our veterans. And through the, the decades, the VA has gone through periods where it got copious funding and was run really well. And people loved the VA. And then other times where the funding was cut or they didn't have good leadership and then they hated the VA. So back then though, they loved the VA and veterans were a huge force because remember it was right after World War II and they basically um, just shot any, any attempt at healthcare reform in the foot. And what, what Truman said is this nation, great nation cannot afford to allow its citizens to cover, suffer needlessly from lack of proper medical care. He sent a bill to Congress. Um, and meanwhile, though, the Korean War happened. And so at that point, that is what the bill that would become Medicare um, was. And so that's when it was written. And it took until Johnson before it was passed. And it was very exciting because Truman was actually the recipient of Medicare card number one. And there's beautiful pictures of that, him getting um, his Medicare card. So Eisenhower, he pushed private insurance, but attempted reform through what's called high risk reinsurance. He really wasn't into um, healthcare reform, but two things happened then. First off, a lot of the elderly were not covered. Only 9% of single people and 14% of couples had any health insurance. And of course, as you know, older people get ill. So um, a lot of people just did not get good care. So they created the Care Mills Bill and that provided a stipend for old people to buy private health insurance. And it helped a total of 1% of people. Um, it was not a good bill. It just, there were so many issues 
with the cost of health care for the elderly, and there was medical underwriting, so it just didn't work. And the big thing that Eisenhower did, though, that has haunted us to this day is Eisenhower administrations who created the tax exemption for workplace health insurance. And that is why our health insurance is tied to employment today. And, you know, that's unfortunate because what happens now, of course, when people lose their job, they get thrown up into whatever the market will um, provide for them at the time. So that's been a big fiasco. Now, Kennedy was much more interested in international affairs, and he had a very tight um, election. And so there really was no legislative appetite for Medicare. He presented it, but a senator was bought off, basically. You know, he th they thought it was going to pass, and so it was voted down 52 to 48. So we did not get any health reform during Kennedy administration. But of course, then you know what happened. Um, when Kennedy was assassinated, Johnson became the president. He is really the most important healthcare president ever. Um, he won election handily in 64 and had the House and the Senate, so a supermajority, so they could pretty much do anything they wanted. And at that point, there were three bills pending and they were all competing bills. There was a Democratic plan to pay hospitals, and that's what has become Medicare A. There is a Republican plan to pay physicians, that's become Medicare B, and there was a plan by the American Medical Association to take care of the poor people, and that's what became Medicaid. And these all were supposed to compete and they were supposed to pass one, but Johnson said, I don't give a damn what it costs, pass the whole damn thing. And I thought that just was beautiful, and he said all those curse words too, so I'm paraphrasing. Um, but, but basically he cursed a lot and it got, all, it got passed. He was brilliant, brilliant legislature. So Nixon, now we have Medicare, Medicaid underway, but we still have a lot of people who weren't employed, who weren't old, who weren't poor, who didn't have health insurance. And so he put forth what was called the Comprehensive Health Insurance Program. It required all employers provide coverage. It limited the employee cost sharing. It had essential, generous essential benefits. And the government actually provided coverage for those who were not employed, so basically, a, um, a public option. So does this sound like anything? I hate not being able to see an audience and people go, yeah, this sounds like the Affordable Care Act. And this is actually what became the Affordable Care Act. So remember, Nixon was a Republican president. Now, for so it didn't pass, of course, because Watergate and, and um, so we were stuck back where we were. Ford did nothing, played a lot of golf, Carter focused on welfare reform and didn't really do any health care reform. Reagan was against socialized medicine at the beginning of his tenure, but then at the very end, he oversaw the largest expansion of Medicaid. So, I mean, I mean I'm sorry, Medicare. And so it, it really expanded a lot of the benefits and the people who were covered. It provided renal care. So the, the expansion there was just so different from what he started with saying he did not want socialized medicine. But um, in health history, it's, it, when he was shot and in the hospital, that's where he really thought about a lot of this stuff and changed his mind. So then Bush came along and he offered tax credits to low income individuals to buy health insurance. So like that Care Mills plan, but the way they were gonna finance it is to take away that tax deduction from employer-based coverage. And that everybody loved their employer-based coverage because it was great back then. So that immediately sunk that deal. Then Clinton came along and he tried to tackle health reform. I think this is getting into the age where most of us remember the Clinton years. Um, if you're my age or even a little younger. And then um, he didn't know the ropes though. And so they, they basically got a bunch of people who didn't know what they were doing in a room, didn't get a lot of input from the outside. So it failed. And then Bush II, it, it created the second largest expansion of Medicare, the Medicare Modernization Act, which created Medicare D, so which is the Medicare drug program. So that's where we were. And then we still, through all those years, did not have health coverage for people who were not employed by employers providing health insurance and for, for, for people who weren't elderly or people who weren't poor. And there was health care underwriting. So if you had significant health issues or even minor health issues, it was difficult or very expensive to get health insurance. So that is why we got the Affordable Care Act. 
The main goal of the Affordable Care Act is that it wanted, they wanted to provide health coverage for everybody. And it had the goal of rebuilding the primary care system, which was very, very important because we had a very poorly funded primary care system, which is very different from other countries. It added a focus for prevention, and that's now why you don't have to pay for any preventive care because they really wanted people to go get preventive care and increase funding for early care of chronic disease. It had things to change payment methods to help rein in the cost. Unfortunately, those didn't kick in until later. And it, they wanted a public option for health insurance to foster competition with the private insurers. Now, you know, we do not have a public option. We can all blame Joe Lieberman for that. He was the senator that was bought off by the private insurers to sink the, pri the public option. That's the only way he would vote for it is if the public option was pulled out. So what went wrong with the Affordable Care Act? I call it death by a thousand pinpricks. So coverage expansion took place over, took precedence over cost control. So they wanted to get everybody covered first. They took a very complicated health insurance system and made it more complicated. And then lack of Medicaid expansion. So the Supreme Court said that um, states did not have to expand Medicaid. And so a lot of states did not expand Medicaid. And this hurt people in the non-expansion states, which made them hate the ACA. But it really wasn't the Affordable Care Act's fault that they didn't get Medicaid. It was their state's fault. And then when um, President Obama lost the House back in 2010, they immediately started having to make budget deals and all the funding for the good parts of the law got, caught, got cut. And so basically they didn't rebuild primary care. They did not rebuild and further um, um, help our prevention and public health system. And that now is biting us in the tail. And then um, there, there were just a lot of good parts of the law that they ended up not, not funding basically. And that cost control measures would happen later in the cycle. And so I, um, I, I'm going to answer questions at the end of this section. Um, so the American Health Care Act, that was what the House passed after Trump came into office. And so that was their attempt at overturning the Affordable Care Act. And so what it did is it basically took the federal government out of any Medicaid administration by just giving block grants to states for Medicaid. And it did not provide guaranteed issue coverage. That means it did not protect pre-existing conditions. It used high risk pools so people would have to go back to the old days of using these special pools just for sick people, which we know do not work. And so the Senate couldn't pull it off. So thank goodness it was, that was not signed into law. And this is one of my favorite um, C-SPAN moments. This is where John McCain walks up. It's, like close to midnight. And if you guys ever can find this, if you can find the story on CNN where they show the clip of that minute where he walks in and he puts his hand up and then he goes down, thumb down. And you can see Mitch McConnell's face just drop. And then all the Republicans standing over here, their head just dropped. And you see the Democrats all over here, like Elizabeth Warren clap and Schumer all of a sudden gets up and he's like, telling everybody to shut up because he didn't want everybody to look too gleeful because they knew that wouldn't look good publicly. So um, that sunk that. So that is the end of health history. Did you guys learn anything? It'd be great if um, you guys just give me a little feedback along the way so I know I'm not speaking into the void. Um, so I see a, a thing here. The ACA channels money through private for-profit for insurance with many deductibles and a tax penalty. Why is this a good model? That is an issue. And that's what we have to talk about and we have to fix. So I answered that. And um, now let's move on to cost of healthcare. I'm just reading some of the thing. Good. Um, I'm glad people learned a lot of history there. People have no idea how we got to where we are. Now, my um, second favorite thing, or actually I don't love talking about the cost of healthcare because this is atrocious. So let's go through healthcare as a percent of gross domestic product. So the United States back in 1970, healthcare was 6.2% of GDP. The OECD, that's all the industrialized nations together had on average, their healthcare was 4.6% of GDP. This was 1970. Now in 2019, we are at 17% of GDP while other countries are 8.8. .8. Now, 
this is a, a um, graph from the OE, um, from OECD, and this is all the countries and their cost of health care and how much the government pays and how much is private pay. And look at the United States out here. We are more than double the cost. This is the average OECD nation. It's like 4,000, a little over 4,000 for the average, and we're over $11,000. That is crazy. And I'm going to talk a little bit about why it's so crazy. Now, let's talk about cost of health care in actual dollars. In 1970, we paid 327 per person per year for health care. That's both government and private dollars. The OECD average was 180. And now in 2019, OECD numbers, Medicare gives a different set of numbers. So those are always a little different. Now I'm staying consistent here. Um, the United States was 11,072 per person per year, OECD average 42.24. So it's insane how much more we spend than other countries. Our average annual inflation since 1970 has been 7.67%. 7 other countries have had a lot of healthcare inflation too. Not as high as ours. It's actually a little bit lower because um, the United States is in here. So it's actually probably about 6.6 .6 for all the other countries minus the US. And one reason they're not so hurting so much now is they started with much lower costs to begin with. So what's the government um, amount of money our government actually puts towards health care? So in the, United, in the United States back in 1970, of the money that went towards health care, the United States paid 37% private uh, dollars with the, the rest. OECD average was 68.8. So other countries put a lot of money, the a lot of government money towards health care. Now, I want to take you through this, the, the decades, though. Now, 1970s to 1980s, it went up a lot because Medicare basically bloomed unchecked. Doctors learned how to take it and how to manipulate it and how to use it. And so and people started using health care more, which is a good thing um, for the most part. And so government funding towards health care went to 42 percent. Now, in the beginning of Reagan's administration, he cut spending for Medicare. So you'll see that it actually went down by 1990 because that was most of the Reagan years. And then at the end when he went out is when he did that big expansion of Medicare. So you see through um, 2000, up to 2000, it went from 40 to 44.2. So that was due to the Medicare expansion. And then beginning of 2000, Bush gave us Medicare D. So you see government expenditure towards healthcare went up about another 4%. And then finally, the ACA came in and ACA coverage actually started in 2014 and now we're up to 50. So the Affordable Care Act really hasn't expanded how much money the government pays towards health care um, compared to what we did with Medicare through the um, Reagan and the Bush administration. So I find that very, very interesting. Now, this just is a nice little graph of what other countries spend. This is the government funding for health care. And you can see the United States, the government funding is just about the same as what other countries percentage wise pay towards health care. And but look at our private dollars. So this is the money coming out of our actual pockets that people pay for health care. This is what our employers pay for our premiums. This is what we pay out of pocket. We are way above all these other countries. So that this is, this is where the extra money spending is coming from to finance our very, very expensive healthcare system. Now, with all that spending, are we healthier? Um, no, we're great at rare disease accidents and cancer. So if you have one of those, that's why people from other countries come to us when they have some rare disease or a, a serious cancer and they're not happy with what their country does. But what we stink at is basic preventive health, common chronic illness, diabetes, hypertension, all those easy problems. We make them very, very expensive to take care of. And that's the big bang of what we all have is mostly common chronic problems. And because we do such a poor job, our healthcare measures stink compared to other countries. And so that what those other countries do right is they have great primary care systems. And instead of choosing four healthcare systems, which I'll get to shortly, they have two healthcare systems at most. Most have one, some have two, 
Nobody has poor healthcare systems. And in fact, there's one um, jur a journalist, our healthcare economist actually says, we actually have come down to have about 84 different healthcare systems. I didn't break down how she broke that down, but here's, here's what we basically have. We have government paid and government provided. So that's like the VA, the armed services, some of Medicaid. And so that really what models, models what England does. Then we have government paid and privately provided, which is what they do in Canada, and that's basically our Medicare. Then we have privately paid and privately provided, which Germany does, and so that is our basic our uh, employer-based coverage or now coverage through the ACA also. And then you have self-pay. So this is our millions of people who have no health insurance at all. It means the individual pays. Many countries have some form of this. So, what do they do different in, in how they deliver health care? Many countries have single billing systems. I'll talk about ours in a, in a bit. Ours is atrocious. They have a national electronic health record. In fact, in England, they, they've had a tough time with COVID too, just because of not doing the right thing from, from the beginning. But once they started getting a grasp of what was happening, happening, it's so easy for them because they all their primary care doctors have one electronic medical record. So it's much easier to do contact tracing for people who do have coronavirus. So gosh, I wish we had had something like that here and we could have something like that there. And a lot of the countries, so like Germany, it's all private, but most of the um, healthcare insurers are truly nonprofit insurers. So they don't take that big cutoff um, that basically goes into the um, pocket of the investors. So those are the differences over big picture differences of how other countries do it. Okay, let me take some questions here. Is it even possible to do clean sheet redesign of the US healthcare system? I'm gonna to get to that at the end. So yes, we are. And then Carolyn, other countries costs are lower, but their taxes are much higher, especially to the middle class. Are taxes part of the cost of healthcare numbers? So yeah, everybody pays for their healthcare differently. And, and so yes, um, the taxes are higher, but they don't have to pay out of pocket for their health care. So if you actually, if, if we actually funded something like Medicare for all, the net expense to especially the middle class would be much, much lower than the extra taxes that in, they would have to pay to pay for health care through Medicare for all. So um, would you explain Germany's systems? I didn't think it was all private. No, they do have some public stuff, but, but mostly they do go through health insurance that's um, done through payroll deductions. And in fact, they have hundreds of different private insurance companies that provide the insurance for their, their population. Um, the Commonwealth Fund has just this fantastic breakdown of every country and, and how they run their healthcare system. So um, if, and it's amazing what others do. And, and, and what bothers me is in our country, we talk about how all these other nations that have universal health care for everybody, how it's all socialized medicine. And that really isn't true. Some of it's private, some of it's government paid. It's all over the board in how they decide to do their health care. But they have universal coverage. They have health uh, outcomes that are way better than ours. And their health care is much, much less expensive, whether it's paid by government dollars or private dollars. It doesn't really matter. So um let's move on any other questions there i think i got that let's so now let's talk about her current health reform and i'm going to cover that basic big picture philosophy of our parties and then we'll go through what the current status is of the affordable care act then i'll go through the trump and republican approach and the biden approach and then i'll cover a little bit of medicare for all now it's real funny like i said um if you love you know, the free market approach, you're going to hate what I have to say. If you love the, the Affordable Care Act, you're going to hate what I have to say. If you love Medicare for all, you're going to hate what I have to say. There's every system, I, I would argue free market care really, it cannot work if it's not regulated by government in some form or fashion, because we had free market systems back a hundred years ago, of course, and that's why government stepped in because People wanted their dollar. They weren't doing a good job with actually delivering good health care. So um, let's move on to the healthcare philosophy. Democrats in general prefer 
coverage over cost. So they want to make sure everybody gets care and, you know, everybody worries about cost, but to them, that's a secondary issue. Now, Republicans value cost over coverage. Now, when I talk about cost, though, they don't really care so much about cost to the individual. They worry about cost to the government. And, you know, I've spent a, a lot of time, you know, I've spent a lot of time on Twitter. Please follow me if you're, if you're there. I have a lot of fun there. I, I am in, unbridled, though. And I ask, and only because I want to know, I, you know, I consider myself a, a centrist initially. And as time has gone by, I've definitely leaned more left because I really, especially on healthcare, and I've leaned very left on healthcare. We need universal coverage. It's good for capitalism because if you have healthy workers, they can do a better job. It's better for employers because if you can remove um, healthcare from employment, that's just a huge administrative and cost burden for them. So providing universal coverage is a good thing. And, and so when I ask Republicans, you know, well, what should government do? And basically the, the final answer, and if there are Republicans on here, I'd, I'd love your take, because you know, I, I think we all need to work together. And, and basically the ones that have answered me, which most haven't, say that we should really should just be doing, government should just do defense and that's it. And, and so they don't want government involved in pretty much anything. And that's why we see a lot of programs to try to reduce um, what the government does. And so they want to reduce how much the government pays for healthcare or puts into healthcare. And they would ideally like to privatize all of Medicaid and all of Medicare and Social Security. So that, that's the take, but please, I'd love to hear if you're a Republican, if, if there's something I'm missing, I'd love to learn a little bit more. And so what's the philosophy of our country? It's we all, all along, we've never agreed that universal health care is a social good. And where every other industrialized nation have, a, they totally agree that everybody should have basic health care. And our country is, the problem is we are, have about half collectivists. That's, so collectivists are people who feel like we should have a basic care for everybody, a base of safety, you know, a place to live, food, and health care, because you need that to work well. And then there are the, the individuals who say, oh, you got to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. And the problem with that is some people aren't born with bootstraps. And I think a lot of people who are pure individualists haven't, haven't been in situations. And, and uh, granted, I have a history in public health. And I have, and I work with the homeless and the working uninsured, so I see the challenges they face. And so, to me, it's just much less expensive to provide at least a base of care. And so, we haven't decided that in this country. We have people who just think if you can't afford your care, you shouldn't get care. And and so, we have to come to grips with that. So, there's basically three choices for us in the, in this country that people talk about: free market care versus the Affordable Care Act versus Medicare for all. And there are many strikes of Medicare for all, so I'll explain those a little bit. And my question for everybody though, and this is my question for politicians that I, I ding them on this all the time, is how do these fix the underlying ills and costs of the healthcare system? That, you know, fixing healthcare payer systems aims to reduce the cost of healthcare by just cutting how much money is put into the system but it doesn't tackle the underlying problems of the system that are driving our cost up. So fixing these payer schemes don't fix things like the admin. And, and, and so Medicare for all would fix some of the admin costs, but it would not fix a lot of the other issues like fee for service, which it could, but, but as, as it's written right now, it doesn't really address it that much. And so fixing poor delivery, doing a bottom up um, fix instead of a top-down fix, fixing poor delivery and costs will make it easier to address which payer system we use. So we've got to get our politicians focused more on why we need to fix the system. So now let's move on to the status of the Affordable Care Act. You know, the Trump administration has continually undermined the ACA. They reduced the open enrollment period, They've given this minimal budget for advertising and navigators to help people get enrolled in the system. 
they've refused to pay the insurers for cost sharing subsidies. Subsidy. So there's two, two credits you get for the ACA. You get a tax credit to help pay for your premiums if you're under 400% poverty level. And then if you're under 250% poverty level, they give you cost sharing subsidies to reduce your deductible and your out of pocket costs. So instead of saying, have a $6,000 deductible, you may have just a $3,000, $2,000, $1,000 deductible, depending on where you are on that poverty level. And so Trump basically said, we're not gonna pay the insurers for that. And this was billions of dollars. And, and, um, and, and they figured out a way, the insurers figured out a way around it so they didn't lose a lot of money that ended up hurting taxpayer, or um, the, the government actually had to pay more in tax credits because they weren't paying cost sharing, cost sharing subsidies. So that was recently ruled illegal by the um, Supreme Court. And so now the government has to go back and pay the insurers when they already got a bunch of money by doing it a different way. So um, it ended up hurting us in the long run. They undermined protections in the ACA uh, for um, reproductive services and for LB LGBTQ support. And in fact, just today, the Supreme Court, or actually it was a federal judge said, you can't um, discriminate against transsexual people in the Affordable Care Act. So, so that went back on them. Um, they supported work requirements for Medicaid. And basically work requirements sound great, but they don't work. And there, they, there are many states now that have tried these work requirements and they make the burden so onerous that people just basically give up and quit trying to get health care. And then they of course support lawsuits that work to invalidate the Affordable Care Act. So there's a big one out right now. It's called California versus Texas. It challenges the entire legality of the ACA because it says now that it no longer has an individual mandate, then it, it's, it should all be thrown out. And what's wrong about this is people don't understand the Affordable Care Act is not just health insurance. It did so many other things, many, many good things. And to just totally invalidate the entire ACA is ludicrous. And so the hearings that this, for, so this is now at the Supreme Court, the hearings will likely occur after the election. So in fact, hearings are scheduled like the first and second for, for all of the um, things that the Supreme Court are going to hear. So it, it's not likely that this is going to be put first on the docket. And if the court follows their previous decisions that they've made on the Affordable Care Act, they'll likely invalidate the individual mandate but keep the rest of the Affordable Care Act intact. So that could cause some issues in and of itself, but Congress can go back and fix that. And so here's the public's view of the Affordable Care Act. The uh, Kaiser Family Foundation, I just love them, love them. Um, great, great organization that does a lot of work in health policy. That's basically all their work um, and other things. But as you can see, back when it first passed, there, there were mixed reviews and then people hated the Affordable Care Act. Um, that's the, the um, red and not many people liked it. But then as once insurance started getting rolled out 2014 and people got used to it and they fixed the systems, the numbers started to improve. And then once the Republicans got in office and actually could get in the place where they could take it away, now people really like the Affordable Care Act and fewer people say they hate it. So um, it's been all over the map. I, you know, the problem, and I'll get to this in a little bit, is we really need, when we do something, instead of just like panning it, let's fix it because there are problems with it and it does need to be fixed in our country. It hasn't got, um, gotten around our, our support of doing that. Okay, so what is President Trump's goal for health care? And, and the Republican. So Trump has said four times now that he is going to release a beautiful health care plan. And he always says in two weeks. And now it's like a joke in the health policy circles of, okay. Um, and in fact, he just did this a few weeks ago. And Sunday, eight days ago, we all were like, say, oh, at midnight, the health care plan's coming out. Of course it didn't. He has not released a comprehensive health care plan. And, and the problem is, is because they really don't have one. If you look at all of the Republican plans they've put forth so far, none of them protect pre-existing conditions. And, and so it's gonna be very tough for them to create a plan that truly protects pre-existing conditions without angering a lot of their supporters. 
So um, he's written though a lot of executive orders and I'm gonna go through those. You know, so this is what we have. This is a big thing. If you guys take away one thing today, I'm going, this is it. What is, what will it take to protect pre-existing conditions? So you can force an insurance company to sell anybody a policy, but what the Republicans will allow is they will allow medical underwriting and allow those policies to be priced based on health. And this becomes an issue. And so when somebody says, oh, we protect pre-existing conditions, the first thing you have to ask them, does that mean that the, that the um, insurance is guaranteed issue, that the, uh, the insurance company must issue a policy no matter what without medical underwriting? And that's what the Affordable Care Act does. The Affordable Care Act has no medical underwriting. So the policies are based on the location where you live. So like if you live in a high cost area like New York, your policies are gonna be more expensive than say Palatka, Florida. Um, on age, and there's a three to one ratio, old people, older people have to pay three times more than younger people. And tobacco use in some states, some states made that illegal. Now, so when the um, Republicans passed their plan in 2017, they had medical underwriting, of course, and so the Center for American Progress did an analysis of how much would health insurance cost if you had policies under, um, uh, under this new law. And so basically, if you had non-metastatic cancer, you would pay $28,000 a year extra for your health insurance. Who in the heck can afford that? And you know, a lot of people have non-metastatic cancer, it's become a chronic disease. If you have metastatic cancer, it's actually, it was like $140,000 you had to pay every year. That's just unaffordable. People, somebody with uncomplicated diabetes, so this may be somebody who's diet controlled or just takes something called uh, metformin, which is an easy drug to take, they would pay 5,600 extra this is in addition to like what healthy people would pay. If you have depression, you'd pay about $8,500 extra. So this is unaffordable. And their plan was though, if people couldn't afford their insurance, then they could go into a high risk pool. We have been down the road of high risk pools. They tend to be overloaded and underfunded and people and doctors don't like to take them. People can't get the care they need. So what are Trump's executive orders? Um, so he's done like seven of them. And these, he's done a lot of orders on COVID. I'm not gonna count those. I'm talking just about executive orders on healthcare policy. So in 2017, he expanded the health reimbursement arrangements. Basically, these are health savings accounts. He made it where you can use your health savings account to pay for individual health insurance premiums. And um, this started in January, 2020, but the health insurers are still trying to figure this out because there were a lot of rules around whether employers, so, so basically what they wanted to do is just say to employers, give your, your employees a lump sum amount and let them go buy their own insurance. And the problem is, is if your employer gives you $5,000, but you know, the average family health insurance is about 20,000 a year, who's gonna pay that 15? So that's an issue with that. He expanded association health plans, um, which are where a bunch of small businesses can, like, like financial planners, can band together and buy health insurance. The problem with these is they do not have guaranteed issue coverage, so they do have medical underwriting. They don't provide all the um, essential benefits. They, they have limits on what they'll pay out. So the, these are not good health insurance. Also expanded short-term health insurance. Short-term health insurance used to cover three months, and now they expanded it to three years. But again, they don't provide essential benefits. They have medical underwriting. So these really are not good insurance plans. So then June um, 2019, this is a good one. It was to create price transparency within the healthcare system. And it's supposed to go into effect 2021, but you can darn bet there are a lot, a lot, a lot of lawsuits pending on this because who doesn't want it? The insurance companies don't want it. The hospitals don't want it. The doctors don't want it because they are able to make so much money by hiding all their costs. Now, so price transparency has bipartisan support, but the lobby money does not want this to happen. So this, uh, there's, 
it's going to take Congress to really make it happen if it's going to happen. But in reality, there's an argument out there that it doesn't really lower costs for consumers. I would argue that you know, consumer nobody likes to shop for health care. I mean, if you're going to have an elective procedure, maybe it's it's easy to shop. But if you've had a heart attack or you have cancer, do you really want to go shopping for your chemotherapy? And so people don't shop. There have been plenty of studies on this. People do not shop for the best price. They just want to be taken care of. But however, having price change transparency, if we're going to have an employer-based system, that will allow our employers to do a much better job of actually shopping for what the areas that are giving you good prices and who's, who's taking you to the cleaners. So health, so this is good, but it's most likely not going to happen. So July 2019, he wanted to improve preventive care for kidney disease, so that's good. Um, so he wanted to improve the number of um, kidney transplants, create artificial kidneys, do more home dialysis, but there was a big lobby that came out and you can guess who that was. It was all the dia dialysis providers because uh, that's a huge industry now and it's funded by guess who? Venture Capital. They have purchased basically most of the um, renal replacement therapy um, places. So that's a lot of lobby money and now they were able to get some of those rules delayed. Am I making you guys angry? Give me some feedback there. I, I'm, I, I'm not trying to make you angry. I'm just saying it is what it is. And so, ooh, I, I think that was said the other day in not a good way. So July 2020, election is getting ready to happen, right? So Trump came out with four different um, executive orders that day. Three got signed. One he's waiting to get some feedback on before he signs it. But the first one is to decrease the cost of insulin and epinephrine. And so epinephrine is used when somebody has an allergic reaction where they can die and it, it's gotten very, very expensive. And so um, to, he wanted to do this through deep get discounts that community health centers get, but it's to eligible participants. So it's only people who are eligible for community health centers. So it sounds great. It made for a great sound bite, but in reality, People aren't going to be able to use it because most people are not a part of community health centers. Then he wants to increase drug importation to lower prices. A um, lot of issues with this, you know, people talk about, oh, we can buy our drugs from Canada. Well, people don't understand, you know, so the reason other countries have lower drug prices is because they have rules and regulations to keep drug prices down, but they only get so much of a a, a, um, a number of drugs that they get for their country. So if you have a country the size of Canada's population, all of a sudden our country wants to suck all their drugs out, they're not gonna let that happen. So there are a lot of issues to just buying um, drugs from other countries to lower our drug costs. And Biden wants to do this too. So I, I think we need to figure out a better way to lower drug prices. And then the third one is he wants to lower drug prices by eliminating um, the middleman kickbacks. These are the pharmacy benefit managers you guys may have read about. This basically though is just targeted to Medicare D beneficiaries. So, um, but ideally it would spill to the rest of the industry. Insurance companies are for this of course, but pharmacy benefit managers are against it. And guess what? They have a lot of lobby money and this also, uh, through a backdoor way, will likely raise Medicare D premiums. And executive orders cannot be written that's going to cause more money to be paid by the government. So Trump can't, or any president, cannot write executive orders where the government might have to pay more money. That takes a true act of Congress. If money is going to be spent, Congress has to make that happen. And so his last one he just did the other day, it improves rural health and telehealth access. And this, you know, telehealth, I think, is one of the good things that came out of COVID. A lot of us have been um, hoping for better telehealth reg um, regulation or um, access for a very long time. And so this has really speared that forward. Rural, the, the way they want to improve rural health, not ideal. And again, there's a funding issue with this because what he wants to do is going to cost the government money. So he can't really do this. It will take an act of Congress. Now, of course, all these executive orders, the, the nice thing, I, I read a lot of legislation. So if you guys ever read the Federal Register, one of my favorite places to go, where 
you know, real legislation is pages and pages of long, long, and it's gobbledygook. Executive orders usually are a nice little one to two page so he can hold that thing open and, and do the, I signed this executive order. And, and it doesn't say much. What ends up having to happen is like the Department of Health and Human Services has to go write the rules and regulations behind the executive order. So it takes a long time. And then people who aren't happy with it usually file lawsuits. So these, these aren't going to happen and or they're not going to happen anytime soon if he gets reelected. It's likely that they're still not going to happen. So that is Trump's um, thing. I'm going to stop a second because I see I've got a bunch of questions. Um, I know through an MMT lens, that's modern monetary theory, and oh, Rick, I, I love you there. So this is a, a study group that we have. Um, has an increase, says an increase in taxes is not needed, assuming inflation could be constrained to provide more comprehensive medical coverage similar to UK or Canada. However, I don't see our politicians not raising taxes and following similar levels of taxation we see in those countries. Do you agree? Um, I would like to think that they would act more like Johnson and fix the system and, and, and make us have a better healthcare system and then worry about where the money's going to come from. And I think the people on this call don't, don't get um, MMT. If you guys could get a book to read, I highly recommend reading Stephanie Kelton's book. Um, it's called The Deficit Myth, and it just does a great job of explaining how deficits work in this country. So I'm not sure. I, I would like to think we can get politicians away from, from just talking about the funding and more towards fixing it. If other country models are any predictor, we will see taxes on the middle class go up two to four times. How do we get affordable, comprehensive medical coverage without our elected officials understanding MMT? I think I've answered that. Um, we need to fix the, his system and bring down the cost, which I'm going to get to. Is there a way to mitigate the frequency of lawsuits once a new plan is introduced and approved, approved by Congress and the President of the United States? Um, it depends. I mean, you know, I do hope we see a change in this country in how we come together around things. And I'm going to talk a little bit about this and in, in how they used to do it, um, how they used to do it in the old days. And maybe all this madness will make us start doing a better job with policy stuff. Down with Vetus Dialysis Center. Yay, I agree with you, Leo. Um, where is his legal authority to issue all these executive orders which apply outside in the real world, outside of the executive branch? I think what you're saying, uh, he can write any executive order he wants, basically, but it doesn't mean it can be carried out. So that's why what will happen is the department where, so, so for example, with healthcare policy, the Department of Health and Human Services would flesh out the executive order and write things. And if it's legal, they'll make it legal. But if it's not, they'll basically say, well, we, we really can't do this. So that's why a lot of... Um, a lot of executive orders are more for showing and especially that's why you're seeing all these in July when we're getting ready to have an election. So it's not going to happen that. Um, mentally delete, oh, on the, uh, Gregory, I see your, your thing now that I've read it. So, okay, let's move on to Biden's health care policy. So what Biden wants to do, you know, of course, he was vice president um, during the Affordable Care Act. And I don't remember what you, um, if you remember what he said when it actually was signed, when President Obama was signed, he's like, this is a big effing deal. And it was a, a, a big to, to do, but it was pretty funny. He was cute when he did that. Now, he wants to add a public option to the Affordable Care Act, which should have been done in the first place. The, right now, it's the, the policy that they said, you know, just because remember, they, they just put out big picture policy. They don't put out all the little details, but it would only apply to individuals. So, so if you go on the Affordable Care Act exchange and you don't have coverage through work, that's where you could get a public option. However, and what people would like to see is for us to offer the public option for employers to buy for their employees. But the other thing that they are offering is that people can opt out of their employer-based care and they could go to the exchange and buy a policy through the exchange and whether that's a private policy or the public option, they could do that. 
and then the employer, they would just increase the payroll taxes on the employer to make up for that since they don't, they aren't paying for health insurance. So it's a little convoluted. I don't love it. I wish they would offer the public option employers directly. Um, it, the public option would have lower premiums, but the problem is, will doctors take it? You know, so like right now, for example, you have Medicaid and a lot of doctors don't take Medicaid because it doesn't pay well. A lot of doctors don't like to take Medicare because it doesn't pay well, but most do because it's such a big behemoth and most and all hospitals have to take it. And the other question is, will it be privately run like Medicare Advantage? And to me, that would be an atrocity. And you will see me screaming very loudly if they say, well, this is going to basically be run by private health insurers, because that's just more money that will go into their pocket. A lot of people like Medicare Advantage, and I don't know how many of you are older are over 65 on Medicare Advantage. And for some people, it works great. But it works, it doesn't work at some point when you get really sick, a lot of people hate Medicare Advantage because you're basically stuck in their system. Plus if you move, there's so many issues with Medicare Advantage that people don't know until they actually have to use it for a significant thing or if they move. Now, he wants to offer more premium, uh, more generous premium tax credits. So right now, the tax credits for the Affordable Care Act are based on what's called the second lowest tier silver plan. And now they would give the tax credit based on a gold plan, which has much better benefits and much lower deductible. They would also eliminate the 400% poverty level cap. So what happens when somebody goes on the Affordable Care Act, if they make under 400% poverty level, so for a single person, that's about $50,000, if they make under that, they get a tax credit. And when you're older, let's say you're an early retiree from age 60 to 65, your health insurance may actually cost, you know, twelve, fifteen thousand dollars a year, and you have a tax credit that limits how much you have to pay. One, but once you hit one dollar over four hundred percent poverty level, you lose that entire tax credit. For some people, that's a ten thousand dollar tax credit, and so that has been a, a it, it just has hit a lot of people hard. And so what they want to do is instead of eliminating that cap, is just gradually ex, uh, extend it. So it actually probably would go out to 800% poverty level and wouldn't be a cliff. It would just be this gradual decrease in the tax credit. And they would reduce the amount of family income that has to go to premium. So right now they can charge 9.8% of adjusted gross income that can go towards healthcare costs. So they would bring that down to say eight, seven, somewhere in there. I don't know that number that they're gonna choose yet. They wanna do a crackdown on surprise billing. And I think if you've never been uh, subject to surprise billing, um, please, I hope you don't. Uh, Florida, thank goodness, has some rules against, some pr pr fairly good rules against that. Many states do not. And so this will prevent charges by providers over which the patient has no control. So that's a good thing. You know, everybody's against surprise billing and this is where lobbyists get into it again. There, there are two different ways they could tackle this. One makes the insurers really mad. One makes the providers really mad. And a lot of the providers have been purchased by, guess what? venture capital companies. So a lot of emergency room physicians now work for venture capital companies, dermatologists, I mean, you anesthesiologists, all of these medical groups are being purchased by venture capital companies and they have a lot of funding to be able to lobby the politicians to vote for whatever it is they want. So this is an atrocity. I dream that we stop this. I don't think, to me, venture capital should not be able to buy physician groups. Now, um, so maybe we would get um, surprise billing fixed if Biden gets in office. Trump has said he wanted to fix it too, but nobody's been able to get there yet. So drug pricing. Um, he has a lot of the same policies that Trump actually has. He wants to allow Medicare to negotiate drug pricing, purchasing from foreign countries, um, cap drug pri prices based on inflation, increase generic drug competition, and then uh, this is a good one, eliminate tax breaks on drug advertising. Drug advertising, you know, they actually spend more on advertising than they spend on R&D. And we are only one of two countries in the world that allow drug advertising and it adds so much to the cost. Plus it makes people end up um, asking for things that they don't necessarily need. So I dream of the day, I hate those drug advertisements. So hopefully that, that goes away one day. 
He also wants to increase funding for public health, community health, telehealth, and rural health. And um, for those of you who know me, I'm, I'm very much, I've been involved in public health for a long time. And uh, you know, back in 2013, I tweeted, coronavirus will be the next pandemic. Little did I know that it really would. There are about 2,000 or more viruses out there that can cause significant issues. And my beef has always been, and I've written, gosh, probably four articles in the last 10 years on how our funding for public health is going to bite us in the rear end, and lo and behold, it really has. So let me take some questions now. I see some. Would the public option be channeled through private insurers? That is a we do not know yet. And if it is going to be, we all need to scream. So I will teach you how to call all your representatives and senators uh, because that shouldn't happen. What is your best guess what we may see if Biden wins and Congress is controlled by the Democrats? Will it be closer to Biden's overhaul of the ACA or will it be closer to single payer system favored by most con con congressional Democrats and Biden agrees to it? Actually, most congressional Democrats do, do not agree with Medicare for all. Most are more into fixing the ACA. So there is a very vocal contingent that is for Medicare for all. Medicare for all is very, very popular. It po polls very well. And Medicare for all would totally work. And I'm going to go into that now. And, and so um, Biden is totally behind the ACA you know, you have to realize he was vice president when it was passed. And so he wants to try to fix it. I do think what will happen, though, is that we have, you know, a lot of people have a mistrust of government. Government doesn't work well. And I would argue, you know, what ha ends up happening is that that there's sabotage of government to make it not work well. And there was a time when government did work well. And so if we can get a president that comes in and actually makes government work well, I think that would change a lot of the attitudes. And so, you know, who knows what's going to happen. But I think if we get a public option that does not get channeled through private insurers, it gives the government an opportunity to show that it could work well. And this may take us down the road to single payer in the future. Who knows? That's why I call this talk the ongoing soap opera of healthcare reform. I am never bored in this space, that's for sure. So let's move on now to Medicare for all. Benefits, simple. Um, it's a one, one system. It would totally work if the government got behind it. It would bring efficiency to the system, which would reduce uh, a, a lot of the cost, not all of the cost. And it would eliminate cost sharing. It would eliminate premiums. Of course, you know, there, there'd be a big political battle over it there would be no private insurer competition. And so this is a, you know, my argument with, with Medicare for all is I think, I love competition. I, you know, so I'm a financial planner. I love having people compete against me and so we can all make each other better. And, but most people don't have that attitude. They don't want competition. And, and so and people in the private sector don't wanna compete with the government and people think the government shouldn't be competing with the private sector. So it just, it's where I think it's a really good thing. And there actually have been studies where the government does compete with private sector and it makes both better. So the medical industry would lead the opposition and they are flush with money. So to pass Medicare for all, uh, especially given the, the, if, a, if Biden's in office, I don't think we are going to see it anytime soon. It would totally work, but the people who are for Medicare for all, and I know we have, um, some Medicare for all advocates on here, you, you've got your work cut out for you. And, and I would argue that we need to spend more energy fixing our healthcare system, proving government works, and then we can get to Medicare for all if that's what the country decides on. Am I doing a good job being politically, I'm never politically correct, but I, 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 I'm of the ilk that there's something good in everything. So I try to point that out, but I also point out bad things and things. So um, that's, that's where I'm going with that. So when people talk about Medicare for all, there are nine different Medicare for all plans that have been submitted to Congress. And, and I'm not gonna read them all to you, but they call them that basically because Medicare polls so well. So there's only two bills that are true what we think of as Medicare for all single payer, and that's Jayapal's bill in the House and Sanders' bill in the Senate. 
So Jayapal's version, it would cover everybody. And it would be implemented in two years. You would have no premiums, no out-of-pocket costs. It would cover all medical services plus vision, dental, pharmaceutical, and mental health. And I hate to tell you, there are other countries out there that do this. And we could do it too. We just have to choose to do it. It would also cover long-term care services. So this is where other countries are struggling because most countries do not have long-term care services. So her, her bill is very robust, has a lot of people behind it um, in the house, but, but um, we'll see what happens. I don't think that, I mean, this, you know, nothing's gonna be voted on this year for sure, but she could resubmit it in the future. So that's in the House. And so in the Senate, you have Senator Sanders, of course. His is actually a little less generous than Jayapal's. His covers all U.S. residents, like hers, four-year implementation, though no premiums. Um, his long-term care uh, benefit is not as, as robust as hers, but he provides all the other services. So that's what it looks like. And there, there's a lot of work being done on how we can flip the job. Uh, I mean, just flip this off and make it happen. It's like how you flip the switch to turn on Medicare for all. And because they're actually, you know, what are you going to do with all those um, people that work in billing? And what are you going to do? There, there's just so much that would have to be figured out on how do you actually implement this. So I think it does need to be more of a phased in implementation. Uh, I know um, Harris, who is now a, a vice president candidate, her Medicare for All plan actually had a 10-year implementation, so I thought that was very interesting. Now, okay, that is all the systems. Any other, and, and what's going on in policy now? Any other questions so far? I'm going to take a sip of my water. Okay, so let's go to my favorite thing of what is real reform? So I love this Rose, Franklin Roosevelt quote. There's a great book. It's actually a textbook, but it's, it's called When Government Worked. And uh, I think that's the name of it. Hold on, let me look at my thing. Um, yeah, no, When Government Helped. I knew that it didn't quite sound right. And it talks about the New Deal and, and what got us out of the Depression. There were issues with the New Deal too. But one thing I loved about Roosevelt is every Sunday he had his radio um, show where he talked about what they were doing that was working. But he'd also talk about what they were doing that wasn't working. We weren't afraid to admit our failures back then. So he said in this address in um, Georgia 1932, the country needs, and unless I mistake its temper, the country demands a bold, persistent experimentation. It is common sense to take a method and try it. If it fails, admit it frankly and try another. But above all, try something. The millions who are in want will not stand by silently forever while the things that satisfy their needs are within easy reach. And we can do this, we can fix this. And so how do we do it? You know, first off, we need to decrease complexity and overhead. We have the most complicated healthcare system in the world. Our overhead is 25 to 30%. Other countries, it's five to 15%. If we could cut our overhead down to 15%, we would save about 400 billion per year. And remember that number, because I'm gonna talk about it in a little bit. Now, what would it take to fix the system? We could have a simplified billing system. We could reduce fee-for-service billing, have a nationalized electronic health record, remove primary care from insurance. So I'm gonna talk about all of these in a little detail. Billing. Right now, we set, spend about $496 billion on insurance and billing-related costs. So this is not on the actual insurance, on, on the administration of insurance and billing-related costs. And it's estimated that about $248 billion of that is wasted. So how do you fix that? We create a central claims clearing. Germany and Japan do this. Japan's overhead for their insurance system is like um, less, I want to say it's 2%. So it's next to nothing. And we could have standardization of forms. Right now, all these insurance companies do different things. You have all these different systems for how you get paid. And then our insurance companies are notorious for declining coverage after the fact. And who gets caught in the middle? It's the patient. 
So one thing we could easily do is as soon as the patient is seen, the insurance company is required to pay the physician. And if they find that it was not a warranted surface, then the insurance company has to go back and collect the money and keep the patient out of the middle. Wouldn't you guys love that? That's what they do. Our country is the only one that puts patients in the middle of having to fix this stuff. And if you're sick, especially if you have a serious illness, do you really want to be doing that? So we need to fix the billing system. We need to fix our fee for service system. Our doctors get paid more to do more. And in fact, they're taught how to do certain things and code things correctly so they can maximize their billing. They're not trying to be unethical. It's the, and, and ideally they're doing everything they're saying, but if you actually look at medical records and what, what actually was done, a lot of them with electronic medical records are just clicking the box, even though the service wasn't necessarily done. So they're getting paid more to do more or at least paid more to document more. We need to institute global payment systems. This is different than bundled payments. Bundled payments are like if you're going to get a knee replacement, the, the insurance company will say, we're gonna pay your hospital $20,000 for your knee replacement, and you guys have to figure out how it's gonna be divvied up, how much the orthopedist gets, how much the anesthesiologist gets, how much the hospital gets. And, and that, that works, that doesn't really work very well overall. And, and so that's bundled, but global payment systems is where you have a, a patient and the insurance company is gonna pay basically a healthcare, a, a group of healthcare providers to take care of that person. So that's one way you can do that. And instead of measuring, instead of measuring like how well you check box, you measure quality on healthcare delivery and you make sure you pay attention to outcomes. So we need to fix the fee for service system. We need to fix our electronic health record. It was totally built around billing. And this is wrong. So doctors, you know, they have to hit all these buttons to bill correctly. But what a health, a electronic health record or, or what a health record is for is to tell the patient's story. And I, I don't know how many of you have been in our in medicine or seen your own health records. It's hard to, to read the patient's story if you have all this health system that, I mean, this health record that you have to click a million times to learn the story. There are health records that are out there that are around patient care and not billing, but of course nobody uses them because that they're, you know, they have to use the ones for billing. And we should have a nationalized electronic record like England has that's accessible by the patient. So you basically own your record and it goes with you wherever you go. And it could have clinical decision support systems to help with diagnosis and treatment. There's so much that could be done, but we're putting our money in the wrong place. So we need to fix our electronic health record. We could remove primary care from insurance. Now think about this. When you have auto insurance, does your auto insurance pay for your oil changes? No, it doesn't pay for your um, car cleanings. It doesn't pay for the upkeep. It only pays if you have a major wreck. It doesn't pay for if you just break down. And so insurance is meant to cover rare or high cost events. And so our health insurance system is actually a health reimbursement system because primary care is not insurable. We should be getting, first off, primary care is cheap. Only 70% of, of people uh, or problems need primary care. And so when you add, when you cover primary care through insurance, you're adding this big underlying cost and bureaucracy that doesn't need to be there. So it adds 25% to the cost of basic primary care, which is what most people really need. And so right now, community health centers, they provide basic medical, dental, and mental health care, medical, dental, and medical, uh, mental health care for a little bit over a thousand per person per year. I think this last year it was a thousand and forty per person per year. And it, and so they is and some are on a shoestring budget, but there are some great community health centers in this country that just do amazing things with their patients. And so if everybody could get care through community health centers, if they could provide the basics and the prevention, keeping our population healthy and productive, and do this as a public service. 
And so these centers can also serve as epidemic preparedness centers for virus, opioid crisis, bioterrorist events. We could have community health workers that are, that are connected with the centers that when you have a, a mom with a newborn at home that can assist that mom. When you have an elderly person trying to age in place, they could check on that person. Or if you've had somebody who's just had major surgery that make sure that that person is doing okay. So a network of community health workers connected to community health centers that could just transform the healthcare system in this country. And once we do that, we can actually remove primary care from insurance coverage because we actually pay more to insure primary care than it actually costs to deliver it. And so then insurance would be used for high cost specialty care, but it would become cheaper because now you would remove the primary care component. So for people who don't want to use community health centers, and to me, these should be a basically provided as a public service to everybody. When you try to give it just to poor people, then you basically create these haves and have nots, and then people fight over funding. If this is something everybody gets, you don't fight over it. You fund it well, you take care of the basics that people need, and you go from there. But if people don't want to do it, let's say their, their community health center isn't fancy enough, they don't have plush seats or um, they're, they don't have great art on the wall. If they want to go, there are now primary care doctors that basically do cash pay services. They're called direct primary care physicians. So they could go to those instead and pay for them out of pocket using their health savings account. So, so we can keep a private option open that, but the person has to pay for it, but it will com compete with the community health centers. And so then insurance can be provided through Medicare for all if we go that route. It can be provided through the ACA and ideally with a public option. So we can you know, create whatever payer, payer system we want on top of it. But now at least people are getting their diabetes taken care of, hypertension, the obesity crisis, all of those basic things can be covered through community health centers. So there would be, of course, up for infrastructure costs, but ongoing, it would be about 350 billion a year. So remember how much I said we waste in overhead, about 400 billion a year. So this would pay for itself. And I wrote an article in Forbes a few years back on this. I really do need to update it because they're, you know, especially with the coronavirus um, pandemic, it'd be nice to, um, for people to say, wow, maybe we should do something like this. So resources, there's so much great reading if you're big into health policy. My three favorite sites to go to regularly are Kaiser Health News, Health Affairs, and Commonwealth Fund. Um, three books that'll really just kind of break your heart. American Sickness, Elizabeth Rosenthal talks about uh, what ails our system. The Heart of Power goes through a great job of healthcare um, policy history. Healing of America, TRE, this is an old book, but he went around um, all these different countries to see how they would take care of his shoulder. And he just does this, uh, this great view of how other people look at healthcare in the world. So you guys can email me um, at, this is my email address. You can follow me on Twitter. And I think we still have a fair amount of time for questions. So um, I see, where can you go to find a community health center in your city? Um, basically, right now, community health centers are only uh, set up and funded to serve people who are um, poor, basically. So, so basically, these are like the health departments. So just Google community health center in, in your city and you should be able to find one. How do we prevent doctors and hospitals from charging whatever fees they feel like? Um, basically, price transparency is going to help that but a better government regulation. What is a community health center? It's more like, it's basically like a primary care practice, except that it's most, some are state funded, some are privately funded, a bunch are federally funded. It's a big network. You can go to, the, there's a website called the National Association of Community Health Centers, and they're like the big umbrella um, of, of community health centers. And so these were created years ago um, through uh, from um, all of Johnson's policies. He's actually my favorite president, and I'm going to have to say that. Um, so uh, health, the health departments and community health centers were so well funded early on. And of course, the funding just kept getting cut year after year. So now they operate, they have to beg for funding every couple of years from Congress. And, you know, basically they're handed scraps. So it's really sad. And so they have to do a big push to get people to call Congress to fund them every year. 
Wouldn't this two-tier system create inequality with a great plan for rich and a crappy one for the poor? It's not a two-tier system. So basically, a, um, if you had primary care for all that everybody got as a public, a public service, that's a one-tier system. And, you know, and, and, and it's going to be well-funded. I know in Australia, it's very interesting. They have a public and a private system. And I have some good friends in Australia that, that they actually make a lot of money. And, and it seems like, he says, that it kind of swings back and forth on how well they do. But their, public, their private system has gotten so expensive that even this guy who makes a lot of money has gone back to the public system. He says they do a much better job. So what we would need to do, again, is we need politicians who are willing to be honest and make government work. I'll never forget when the Affordable Care Act came out. And this was not when it came out, when, when, the, um, when the, it actually was going to eff into effect and they just created healthcare.gov, you know, the website that was, um, that went down, that I was scheduled to give a speech uh, to, it was to 200 African-American ministers in, in Jacksonville because they were going to do education on how to sign up to, for the Affordable Care Act through their churches. And so the person who was speaking with me was um, was a she was part of the Obama administration. She was the regional representative for the health Department of Health and Human Services out of Atlanta, and she came down to speak. And that the a, the website had just crashed, and the, she was not allowed to say anything bad about it. And the, the these ministers are basically screaming at her, "Why isn't this website working? What's going on on with it?" And so I basically took over the talking about say here's what happened here's what we think is going to happen here's how they're going to fix it but i just had an honest conversation she was not allowed so we need and this is both sides they do this messaging thing where it's like you can't go off message from what your boss said and if you do you're fired and so we need to bring more honesty transparency and accountability back to government so let's vote for people who do that um so you said that only 248 billion was wasted overhead. No, um, 248 billion is wasted overhead just in our billing and, and insurance administration system. There's a lot of other waste in the system. And so I'm, and when I'm talking about the, you know, there's 400 billion in overhead, that's if we bring total overhead down to 15%. You have to realize countries, I wanna say Germany's overhead is like 5%. If we could bring our over our total overhead, not just the billing and administration overhead, down to five percent, that would be huge. So, um, so that is incorrect. Um, would these changes you're suggesting be implemented within a modified version of our current health system, or only once we move towards M uh, Medicare for all? Well, for me, this would be the first step. So, if you implement a a nationwide community health system that's well funded well run it's the first step to proving that government can do something well and then that would make people more open to medicare for all if the if private insurers can't get it right and start actually doing the right thing for people so so it would this would be something that could move us to medicare for it's it's to me agnostic to medicare for all really we can do the insurer system however we want aca you know uh, or medicare for all it doesn't matter but we need to address our primary care issue and by getting our country healthier through good primary care that'll in the long term, make us healthier and ideally bring down healthcare costs. How do we address utilization like obesity, et cetera? That, I mean, to me, part of the problem is our healthcare system is so, um, it's geared towards the wrong thing. It's geared towards end stage care. So it's after you get the problems and we need to fund a lot more money towards preventive care towards early care of common chronic diseases, so early care of hypertension, diabetes, mental health issues, so that we don't have to um, go down the road, road of all this expensive care later. So we'd be flipping the switch what we're paying for. It would be more expensive at first because we have so many issues in this country, but ideally it would get cheaper down the road. 
Um, your plan is more affordable than the AHC, a far cry from the 20 to 30 trillion proposed by Sanders. Have I presented this? Now, I want to be clear. My plan is only for primary care. We still need to have a healthcare system that takes care of everything else. So no, you, you can't compare um, these plans to Medicare for all. This is basically ways to fix the system from the bottom up while we deal with that payer system of Medicare for all or the, uh, you know, the Affordable Care Act, how we, however we want to do that. So um, I have presented this to, it's very interesting. I wrote this plan back in 2012 during the Romney-Obama election. And um, a number of people read it and, and I was actually uh, consulted, uh, I was asked to consult with a Freedom Caucus member because he was very interested in it. And basically said, this is sort of like MMT. Rick, you know what MMT is, it's like, Congress gets that this would be great, but it's too big a bite to chew. And so that's why we need a, a politician that has a lot of vision who could basically sell people on a, gra a grander vision instead of the same little stuff that we're doing. So I think this would be a, for a good first step, but we got a way to go. Okay, any more questions, any comments? I reposted that list of books, I put it up there for you. So, Okay. Carolyn, that, that was, uh, my mind, I'm, my mind is boggled. <laughs> I don't know if that's good or bad. <laughs> no, no, very, very important information that is of great interest to, to our audience and should be of great interest to, to everybody. And, uh, lots of, I see lots of jumping off points in your talk where I, I want to find out more. So you, you really, give me a roadmap to understand what's going on. I really thank you very, very much for being with us tonight. I love doing this. Um, so please, you know, one of the things that I, I keep telling people is get involved in government. It's really easy to call your politicians and to, to say, have you considered this? And when there's a grassroots effort, they actually do listen. People think, oh, you know, I'm calling my senator and I'm leaving a voicemail but I've worked in politics for a long time now and they actually do pay attention to the calls they're getting. They don't always act, especially if you have a politician who's an ideologue that's only gonna go with the party no matter what. But at least if you get, you know, you get a bunch of people calling you and you know you have a higher chance of hope that you're voted out of office if you're not actually acting. Right, right. Once again, thank you very much. And uh, we had a good turnout tonight. Thank you everyone for coming. Uh, don't forget to check out our uh, meetup uh, group. Also, our website is very easy to find. It's simply fcfs.org. That's for First Coast Free Thought Society. Right. Thank and, you and have a good night. Hey, Mark, one yeah. thing people said, are my slides available? I'm happy to email you my slides. Or yeah, um, Please do. Yep. Um, we can get um, those out to people. Okay, everybody. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Okay. Good night.